program number 56, 3, 2, 1. Today we present another in a series on bargaining fundamentals with Duan Woodland, president of National Farmers Organization. Recently he spoke at Great Falls, Montana. We've been excerpting highlights from these discussions because he reviews collective bargaining for agriculture. Here Devon Woodland discusses grain bargaining. Grain is important because it is the key to all agriculture pricing, particularly feed grain. And of course feed grain and the, the milling grains run close together and they follow a parallel. But feed grain is extremely important because it is the key to all agriculture pricing. It is the input item into milk, into hogs, cattle. Grain is the key. And you must get in a position to price grain if you're ever going to have a, a lasting effect on any other farm commodity. What determines a profit or loss as far as feeding hogs is what my feed costs. The thing that determines a profit or loss when I feed cattle is what my feed costs. The thing that determines a profit or loss when I'm milking cows is what my feed costs. And so feed is extremely important. And one of the challenges of the organization is as we represent all these commodities is to keep the dairyman and the hogman and the cattleman from feeling that the price of grain is too high. And then Woodland said it's a challenge with a lesson to be derived. What we have to learn as producers is we have been living off of each other and the dairyman has only made money when he could buy grain cheap, not realizing the need of the grain producer and the hog and the cattle man, so we've been leeching off from each other. Now, the price of grain is not too high. We have to take the approach that the price of cattle and hogs and milk is too low. And so when that grain producer begins to make a profit, it isn't because he's too high that the others aren't making money, it's because they have got to boost theirs, and they can't live off of that grain producer. And so that's a hard lesson to learn, but we must learn it. Then a point about keeping control of the flow. Now you must have inventory control of grain. That is a must, it must come. For example, if I have a strong cash market on grain, I'll move my grain into a cash market. If I have a weak cash market, what do I do? I begin to look for ways to market that grain through a secondary market. I'll increase the number of hogs, I'll increase the number of cows I milk, or I'll increase the number of cattle on feed. And so, Grain, a weak market in grain, will destroy every other farm market. Devon Woodland, in another of his talks on fundamentals of agricultural collective bargaining. I'm Phil Allen for NFO's Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 57, 3, 2, 1. Here's Info Consumer Reporter Kathy Morrison has some cost increase data for us from a 10-year period, 1972 to 82. Kathy? In 1972, farm production expenses totaled almost $53 billion. In 1982, they totaled $140 billion. That's a 165% increase. Where do you think these big increases came from, Phil? You're asking me the questions now. Well, probably taxes, hired labor, feed, livestock expenses. Wrong, Phil. While these all did increase, interest payments moved up 376%, from $2 billion to $10.5 billion. How about the seeds that the farmers plant, which grow and feed millions of people? Their cost was up 350%, from $1 billion to almost $4 billion. In 1972, wheat was selling for $2.22 a bushel, and the 82-83 yearly crop average was $3.55 a bushel. That's only a 60% increase. Corn was $1.91 a bushel in 72, with a $2.68 crop average for the 82-83 season, which is a 40% increase. And soybeans were $5.35 in 72, and $5.69 in 82, which is only a 6% increase. Well, that's quite a difference in the cost of planting and the price received at the marketplace. Yes, it is, and that is one of the many factors in the rising farm foreclosures. 
When operating costs continue on the up and parity is only at 58 percent, farmers must live on borrowed money. They find it very difficult to survive the pressure of the high interest rates without cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Okay, tell me some more farm production expenses that increased. Fertilizer escalated 333 percent. Repairs on machinery zoomed 366 percent. Hired labor rose 165 percent and taxes 60 percent during the 72-82 period. How about livestock costs, which included the buying, veterinary bills, death loss, and so on? That was up 45 percent, and the cost of buying feed was up 107 percent. What do you conclude, Kathy? It's time for farmers to unite to get that better price at the marketplace and try to stop all these farm foreclosures before it's too late for everyone. Remember, vegetables don't grow in cans, meat doesn't come prepackaged, and milk isn't manufactured in the carton. We need these farmers to continue feeding the world, but they can't do it for nothing. That was Kathy Morrison, consumer reporter for Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 58, 3, 2, 1. Rick Avila, National Vice President of NFO, spoke at a meeting at Salina, Ohio, where some 800 came out to hear an explanation of NFO's big grain block being organized for the Gulf. At a news conference after the speech, a reporter asks Avila about agricultural debt as we go further into 1984. American agriculture is $220 billion in debt. $220 billion. We had $19 billion in income last year. That's just barely a 10%. That's just barely a recovering in interest. See? We had nothing for our labor or management. And a question from Gary Wolf, farm director of WIMA Lima, Ohio. Richard, I know that you folks are especially concerned about where grain prices have been headed lately because of uh, uh, our supply situation last year. The PIC program and such, this decline in grain prices was really a big shock to folks, wasn't it? That's correct. Uh, and you see, with declining prices and no product, you know, where's our supply-demand theory? We're looking at PIC was supposed to reduce su government supplies, which did a good job. Mother Nature stepped in. Mother Nature gave farmers a real opportunity to do something this year on price because for once we're not sitting there with a giant surplus hanging over our heads. The philosophy behind this though is to reduce the uh, available cash grain supplies though, right? Not necessarily. The situation is, is that you've got to look at two things. The cupboard's bare. That's number one. And we are not seeing the increase in the price of grain out here that will relate back to the farmer. Now, they're, they're getting it out of, the, out of the commercial sales of it, but the farmer is not getting his just due. So as we look at it, we have to do something to counteract the philosophy that's coming from the Department of Agriculture and the government and through some of the news media that the farmers are going out here and plant fence row to fence row and that we're going to have an 8 billion bushel crop this next year. If that would happen, you're looking at a dollar and a half corn, you're looking at disaster. Bankers are going to jump out of windows because farmers are not going to be able to pay their, their, their bills and handle their situation. So we would rather the farmers got four dollars and a half for his corn and produce what the, what the domestic market needs, not give it into the hands of the government to come back and use as a club over our heads at later time. And I think if the farmer can realize and can see some constructive work being done on four dollar and a half corn, he doesn't want to have to plant fence row to fence row, work 24 hours a day, take consideration all of the problems with the weather and everything else. He wants to produce for a market. Rick Avila at Salina, Ohio, discussing ag bargaining. Next time Avila's reply to a reporter's question about what if farm prices go higher. This tape was made available to Here's Info by Gary Wolf, Farm Director of WIMA Lima. I'm Phil Allen for NFO's Here's Info, and that for today is something to think about. Number 59, 3, 2, 1. When Rick Avila, Vice President of National Farmers, spoke to a crowd of 800 at Salina, Ohio recently, he explained NFO's big grain block for bargaining at the Gulf. At a news conference afterward, 
A reporter asks Avila. What's the uh, magnitude of this program to consumers and not only to farmers? You know, what's the total scope of the, of the uh, block program? On consumers. They're my best friends. They're my, uh, my life's blood because I am a producer of raw material. In order for me to, to really do a job for consumers, I have to make a living. I have to have income, I have to retire debt, and I have to make payment. I cannot give my product away and, and hope to survive and still give them cheap food. What we're trying to do with consumers is by generating enough money in agriculture that will put people back to work, they'll have the ability through work, see, to buy the products that we produce. Now, for every dollar that's generated in rural America, before that dollar retires, it works its way through $7 through the economy. $4 locally, $3 on an additional on a national scheme. So for every dollar that we reinvest in agriculture, we're putting people back to work, they pay their taxes. Think what that would do if everybody was back working and a farmer was buying again, buying the tractors and buying the material and buying the equipment and the paints and the fences and, the, and all of the things that we need to upgrade our operations across the country, talking about across the country overall. Buying the things. I know, for example, when hogs hit $60 not so long ago out in southwest Iowa, the hardware stores were sold out of staples and fence posts and paint and things like that. That Farmers don't put that money in a sack and hide it under their pillowcase. They spend it. And that, that creates jobs. So what we're trying to do is maintain, for example, a cost of living that's very reflective in terms of the consumer. If she's paying 16% of its disposable income right at the present time, if we got 90% of parity or, or an equitable price, it may only cost her 19%. But you see, she would, she would have the food available. So you look at the alternatives. If we do not have a viable family farm operation, you look at corporate structure. That's the only thing that can replace a family farm is a corporate structure. And if you look at that, when they have to pay the help, Where's that money going to come from to pay the hired man? Is he going to work the weekends? Does he want time and a half? In other words, what would our food bill be if we didn't have the family farm? I would say that it would be two to three times higher. Rick Avila, following his talk at Salina, Ohio recently, he explained farm bargaining. Tape of Avila's news conference was furnished here's info by Gary Wolf, farm director of WIMA Lima. I'm Phil Allen for here's info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 60, 3, 2, 1. March 20th is National Agriculture Day, a moment set aside to recognize and honor the farmers and ranchers who feed the nation and much of the rest of the world. No one objects to being recognized or honored, but the people on farms and ranches are to be forgiven if they notice on Agriculture Day that it's kind of like National Secretary's Day. One stenographer quipped, why don't they give us a raise instead of a rose? It's also somewhat like Dad's Day or Mother's Day. A well-deserved sentimental thought is seized upon by all the gigantic apparatus of the commercial world, and the real dynamic then becomes how much stuff can we sell in the name of honoring dad or honoring mom? This is what I think we have mostly in Agriculture Day. In fact, I heard a long discussion one time of a coming advertising campaign by one of the big petrochemical companies. The firm was going to do little commercials expressing appreciation to farmers and expressing thoughts that farmers agree with, like how the farmer now, because of his efficiency, feeds far more people than in former times. Another was how the farmer and rancher really provide jobs for city people, and there would be a warm glow of appreciation by farmers who would then be more disposed to buy the chemical. Also these days, we see animated cartoon herbicide containers shaking, puffing, and then slurping up the weeds instead of sprinkling the field with chemical. A season or so ago, we had one with big feet stomping the fields, and never is the slightest hint that they dump chemicals on the ground. I have a thought for Agriculture Day. Why not show farmers and ranchers working together and getting better prices and learning how to put the price tag on the way other businesses do? There would be an Ag Day. 
I'm Phil Allen for Here's Info, and that for today is something to think about.